you've never probably heard about one shot but i'm sure you've heard about undertale right one shot is a 2d driven story game that rivals the likes of undertale except without that horrible fandom play as nico who has the biggest pogger face throughout the entire game and that is nico, it's Rome. no no not that nico either her objective is to deliver this ball of light to the top of a certain tower to save the world she wakes up in sounds pretty simple right not really you see a lot of one shots gameplay actually happens outside the game similar to how Do Doki Doki throws traumatizing PNG files onto your computer. With one shot, it does something similar. Now, without getting into spoilers too early into the video, you don't play exactly as Nico. You're more as Johnny Silverhand in V's brain, but with a little more godlike ability. This game destroys the fourth wall, like, a lot. If anything, this game is the wall, and when you run the game, this game is what separates you from the virtual world and what separates Nico from the real world, and it's the program that's causing this divide. I only heard about this game a while back off some like shitty Gmod add-on, and I just dismissed it as some dumb furry game, but what really drew me in was the reviews. Once in a lifetime experience, best game I've ever played, wall and heartbreaking. Surely this game can't beat Undertale, which mind you is one of the best story games I've ever played in my life. Plus it sounds track i had to give this game a go so for 10 bucks off steam and 20 second download speed we're in the main menu of this game really rivals that of the first half-life with how basic and bare bones it looks listen to how the main menu music for this game isn't really welcoming like most games it has a very ominous sound and it doesn't sound very inviting especially when compared to most games that have this over-the-top wacky and welcoming song that plays i know if it's just me but this sounds very lonely which is setting a tone for the rest of the game already starting the game nico wakes up in a dark and unknown room walking around you'll find a tv remote just laying around go south and the doors lock go west and you're in the bathroom in the bathroom you'll find out that the tub doesn't run and that there's no water in the toilet this is basically implying that th this house or room has no electricity or running water you'll be able to pick up a branch from this dead tree now let me be honest with you from here I had no fucking clue on what to do. I try to interact with the bookshelf, use the computer, but there's an input password prompt, and go back to bed. So I was stuck already on the first room, but I remember this game was a puzzle game. So I viewed my inventory and I saw a TV remote says it's too hard to read in the dark light. Go to the window and you'll see it has a sob glowing light. Oh my god, what an idiot. So <clears throat> when you interact with the TV remote near the window, you'll see that all of the numbers except three, which is in red, four, which is in yellow, two, which is in blue, and zero which is in green are missing and put this code into the computer and you'll get a message stating you found me and followed up by not much of the world remains which you know kind of explains why the water and power is out the computer will start asking you do you really want to save the world when you continue you'll get a pop-up that says your actions will affect nico note that this computer is not talking to nico these messages are directed towards the player and not the protagonist of the game it'll then tell you that your mission is to help nico leave and then all of a sudden what the fuck the game minimizes and says you have one shot than your system name oh yeah don't mind why it says extra and weird japanese characters my system name is extra thick so it just pretends it says my name now you know why the game is called one shot you literally have one shot at helping nico leave this can also be interpreted as you have the game itself one shot which i'm gonna tackle that theory later on in the video coming back into game nico will hear the sound of the door unlocking this is a door south of him that was locked previously when you go through the door you end up in another room like you know what doors usually do nico will then call out for anyone in the house you may think that this is her home but it's really not a broken tv a broken sink an empty refrigerator that literally just has an empty alcohol bottle this obviously isn't her home it's an unfamiliar environment to us just as it is to her when you go to the fireplace it hints that it couldn't be lit since the wood was never used combining the bottle of alcohol and the dry branch then sparking it up with the broken tv lights up the fireplace then you'll see this weird pixel thing poking from the ground thanks to the Light. It's a basement key. Wow. Going down the long basement stairs, like, did they seriously have to make it this long? I've been walking down here for 20 minutes. At the bottom, you'll see a light bulb. Nico then picks it up and then there's light. Note how the music changes when she picks up the light bulb. It's more happy and brightful compared to the dark and scary music of this game. You'll notice that light 
is an essential part to this game. So far, it's been the only thing about this game that isn't depressing or scary. Not only it changes the music to be more happy, but light is what helped you see the code on the remote. It's also what helped you spot the basement key from the fireplace, and it's also what's gonna open this weird medieval prison door for her. Putting this light bulb thingy in the door, and now we're all of a sudden in some weird looking factory. Pretty strange since we were just in some wooden cottage. Going outside, we get a cutscene of some massive citadel looking building. Now we're outside. This doesn't look very home-like if you ask me. Why were we in a cottage but now we're in what looks like to be space? All over this map you'll see that there are robots that have no power dotted about. Obviously showing that this place has been abandoned for some very long time. But not all robots here are left to rot. We then approach some dice man looking motherfucker. And as we speak to him the first thing he notices is the light bulb. The one we picked up from the basement and still carrying with us. Nico seems confused by this. And the robot greets her to their world. This obviously obviously isn't Earth or some moon colony, it's its own standalone world. Nico states that she's lost and this is when the robot asks her do you remember how she arrived here. Nico says she's not sure. Remember, the first thing we saw in this game is Nico waking up. She just woke up in the world, no spaceship, no teleportation, just waking up in bed in this weird ass house. The robot calls this environment a unfamiliar dark location, just as his prophecy foretold. What the fuck is this elder monk type shit? He then states that Nico is the savior they've been waiting for that'll save their world from eternal darkness. See why I said light plays a major role in the game? What eliminates darkness is light, and this robot states that their darkness is eternal. You then can ask it four questions. One about the world, the light bulb, the computer, and going home. When you ask about this weird ass world, robot guy brings up one thing of interest. That the tower we saw in the beginning of the cutscene actually used to hold their sun, and their world wasn't always this dim. When you ask about the light bulb, the robot tells you that 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 is their new sun, since the previous sun went out. But there's still light in this world because of an element called phosphor. Phosphor is actually a real life element that emits light when exposed to radiation. You can actually find it in many appliances you use. LEDs, LCDs, and x-rays as well. You know, when he says phosphor, I thought he meant that badass kill streak in modern warfare. In this world though, phosphor still emits light because it's stored energy from the previous sun and it's now their only source of illumination. Note that he says at the end, when the last of the the light dies, their world will too. This basically makes him tell Nico that Nico needs to go on top of the tower and restore the sun with that light bulb. But he does warn Nico because the bulb is fragile and if it shatters, their world will too. Now, asking about the computer is when shit gets really interesting. Nico will bring up what the computer back in the house said, like, your actions here will affect Nico, even though, you know, she is Nico. The robot will then tell her that those messages were meant for, yeah, again, my system name is supposed to be here, but I named my computer something ridiculous so the game doesn't understand the syllables. Just pretend it's his paracosm again. Nico then will be confused by square, 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 square. Then you learn, wait, that you're actually the god of this world and that you will provide guidance for her journey. Nico will then try to contact you and ask you a few questions. She'll say your name and then you'll get a few dialogue. Options. Yes, I can change my name finally. So I told this chick, no, that is not my name and now I can change it. Uh... Let's think of something funny. Ben Dover. You know, anything's better than extra thick at this point. Then she'll say, nice to meet you, Ben Dover. <laughs> Woo! That was a lot of talking with that idiot. Let's just hope he's a non-essential character in the story and that we don't have to interact with him anymore. So once dialogue ends with him, you're free to explore the world, kind of. And the shed behind him is a lot of interesting things, which kind of is a lot of papers lying about. But Para! How can papers be interesting? World building. There's one in the back that's particularly interesting and what it is is what seems like to be rules for robots. A robot may not injure a living person. A robot must obey orders. A robot must protect its own existence. What this is is actually the laws of robotics which you probably know is from iRobot. No. But this is really interesting. Everywhere, not even around the planet, but this single room, there are a lot of abandoned robots. Is there some kind of revolution? Was there a robot war or something? What best supports this theory is a paper on a table on the other side of the room that says the use of a robot as a replacement head seems unorthodox, especially the one responsible for last year's incident. What in the shit is last year's incident? Or talking about un unorthodox treatment of a robot? Obviously, something here isn't right. And I gotta admit, it's like 
some cool ass world building for so early on in the game. In some room tucked away, you can find some generator that's off. You can't do fuck all with it. When you go outside and walk east of the building, you are gonna end up in some massive abandoned factory, and inside you'll find more robots. So this is where all the robots we've been seeing are produced, more than likely. There's still one machine that's ramming the absolute hell out of nothing. Ugh, what if we were to put something in there? So with absolutely nothing to do in there, the best course of action is to just, you know, leave. Eventually, you'll walk into this house and you'll meet what looks like, I like to call this the lesbian version of Undyne. When you approach her, the first thing she notices is the light bulb. Just like the prophet robot in the beginning, it seems like no one so far cares about you. Except the light bulb, that's like the only thing they care about. Which, you know, is understandable since their son is gone and they haven't seen light in years to them. But this person is different. They want Nico to leave and let the world die off naturally because she believes that it's highly improbable that the sun is gonna fix it. But you know, Nico can't leave so we really gotta fix this. Anyways, you'll get stuck in some conversation with her and all she tells you is that the tower was there since the beginning of time and that if Nico delivers it there, she gets to go home. Cool stuff, so I decided to leave. When I did leave and try to go into this mine thingy, she decided to stop me again and tell me that if I wanna go into this Patrick Star rock looking thing she needs to go in since mines have been abandoned forever good thing i did go in because i found some abandoned camera going right is the rest of the mine robot lady explains to nico that the mines were the first to be abandoned when the sun went down due to the initial panic and that most of the mine has already collapsed therefore we're not allowed to go there at all so yikes i headed back to her house anyways because i felt like i was wasting time i saw some shiny thing in the bookshelf just you know how we saw the shiny thing in the floor earlier it was the basement key so i decided to pick it up i'm literally looting her house wow so it turns out that it's actually a screwdriver so i went full crafting table mode and used the screwdriver to pop out the lens and all i got right now is a single lens great now i don't know what i'm supposed to do at all i went around and found this area of the map where i'm not supposed to go to since the air is too poisonous now people would usually say that's map boundaries but what i'd say is we're supposed to go there but i can't because we're gonna die to be honest now i'm absolutely fucking stuck I already seen everything there is. The mine, her house. There's nothing on the outskirts besides a vault that's password locked. And we already seen everything in the factory in the weird house near ProfitBot. So I decided to go all the way back to where I first spawned. And out of nowhere, there's a bed. Nigo says that she's tired from walking and if it's alright if she can take a nap. I don't get why she's asking you about it. But now I have the god-given ability to alter her sleep schedule. So, well, I'm gonna be nice and I decided to say yes. What happens after that is the game closes out. Oh shit. So far, it still feels like the game is shrouded in mystery. Computers breaking the fourth wall to talk to us, the main character being aware that they're being controlled. I feel like there's something underneath all of this that we're not seeing. And the best way to know is to keep playing, so I opened up the game again and decided to keep playing. When we launch the game, we're greeted to Nico in the middle of a wheat field, but there's actually sun and vegetation, both which are absent in the world while playing. The next slide is Nico confused, looking around like she just saw aliens for the first time or something, and she's just looking around. The final slide is her staring at the sun, and then, ah, uh, goddamn, we're back in the game. Looks like it was all just a dream. Nico will then ask Vent. Why did I choose this name? She'll ask you if you're there and you'll have to reply prompt with just the word yes on it. Come on, I just wanted to say no. Nico will then tell us that she had a dream where she thought she was really back home and how she looked at her son, which back in her home isn't a light bulb, but a big ball of fire. She also assumes that you're from this world since she says, I don't think I could hold my son like the son from your world. You then tell Nico that this isn't your world either. Wait, if Nico isn't from here, you aren't from here either. How did we end up here? Nico is in shock of this information because the whole time she thought that you're a native and she'll then ask what your home world is called. I chose Earth because I'm an honest human being and Nico decides to crack a joke and says, I like the stuff on the ground and then asks if you live underground like a Reddit admin. I say no because I'm not that big of a loser and then the conversation shifts to the sun. Nico's son in her home world acts literally the same way as our son does in real life but she's telling this to us because it's kind of special because, you know, we haven't seen the sun in so long. Strange how we can take even the most minor things for granted and then miss it when it's gone. After this spit sharing talking match about how similar our worlds are, we're back in the game. At the end, there's a metal pipe. You don't know how useful that would have been earlier. You know why this random pipe is useful? 
because with it you can go crush it under the machine rammer and it makes a crowbar and then with that you can open this random box remember this one once you open it up you get a broken solar battery then once you combine that with the single lens you fix the battery <laughs> I don't know how that works but okay from there you charge the battery through the light bulb and now it finally works you have a charged battery this game seriously rivals minecraft with its crafting system from there i headed to the most obvious place to insert this battery which is the machine once you insert it it goes through some booting process and boom everything is finished oh well what the fuck did that do walking outside and the holy fuck what the hell the robots are alive and interactable so they weren't abandoned this whole time they were powered off by this general Remember the notes from earlier? Could they have been turned off because the robots started acting apeshit? Sure seems like turning them off was an intentional thing by the people before they left here. You can go around and talk to them and one asks, did you power the generator? Nico responds, I guess we did. Notice how Nico's using the freeze we. She now just sort of accepting the fact that you exist and is in her brain and helping her. Because before she knew you, she's been using the word I, 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 but now she's using we. Just pay attention to that. I think is pretty sweet she acknowledges you all seems good but remember this computer yeah that one that's the one i'm talking about the same one which broke the fourth wall to tell us what our mission was in the beginning of the game it's now back what's the harm in interacting with it i guess when I mean, you go use it this time it windows your game and says i see you've been making progress in this world bend over but the progress stops here boo that sucks thumbs down i believe you need a code to unlock a certain box yes actually near the cave system there's an abandoned box actually just sitting there with no hint to open it besides just the enter password prompt Computer then throws a mass of plot twists and says that the code no longer exists in this world. By this world, it means the game world. Continue talking with it then, great, another pop-up jump scare. Now it asks, do you understand what this means, Bend Over? I decided to be a prick and answer no. Then this sentient AI will go on a rant about how retarded you are and it'll say, this document is an exception. See how document is in color text? So we see what the game is hinting at us, pretty obvious. This is where I personally think shit gets even more interesting it'll say i was able to salvage it because nico needs a code to progress i'm confused here about the use of the word i here who is i and what is this person or thing helping us for it'll then go tell you to fuck off and find the document so i brought up my document folder right here so now the game wants you to open up there it is document dot one shot i was not there before by the way like at all the game just threw that in there so yeah when you open it up and read it it says dear <laughs> message to you and i'm able to make it brief i have left you a journal part of which is written in a language that i also have look for a metal safe in the quarry to the east somewhere between the ocean and lookout point the code you need is 234812 here's a full document in case you want to pause and read it all all this cryptic shit could actually mean something or just a developer being cool and edgy but it does censor some important information besides the code which is what we need so go insert that shit in putting in the code actually works but here's the thing nico didn't know what the code was since she doesn't remember seeing one so that computer in no way was communicating with her but to us the player instead inside the safe is a gas mask and a weird looking book with a weird language remember how the document brought up just the word language what if it's referring to this book when you start heading away and what happens what the f what is that it looks like the game is glitching out on us i don't know what the fuck that was but it's strange thanks to the gas mask we're able to go to the rest of the barons which is just full with this poisonous gas a little bit forward you'll find another robot factory with a pair of rubber gloves and you can pick it up and and a boarded up doorway which you can get in with the crowbar inside this boarded room is a ton of robots that are off and also is just a sponge laying there i know it looks like i'm hoarding the weirdest shit but all things you can pick up in this game are needed for story and game progression you also find two ripped out pages with instructions on how to make acid keep this noted in your mind as well near the second factory you'll find what looks like to be a fucking settlement with robots everywhere and also what inhabits there is this huge behemoth of metal it may look hostile, but it's friendly. Reminds me of an iron golem from Minecraft. I'll call this guy Big Boy since he doesn't have an official name. Big Boy asks what you're doing here because humans should have evacuated a long time ago. Nico tells him the same thing she's been telling everyone who's surprised they've seen her, that she just got here and shows Big Boy the sun, to which leaves Big Boy speechless. He also states that greeting you was not part of my programming, that instead Prophet Bot was the one in charge of greeting you since he can't speak with anyone else. This basically 
means that Prophet Bob only was built to meet the new savior of the world and wasn't programmed to speak or do anything with anyone else while Big Boy Bot was built to guard the settlement even though, you know, everyone left. Nico questions why he's still here even when everyone has gone and Big Boy says that he hasn't been tamed. You'll see this word tamed everywhere in the game. Keep this in the front of your mind just because of how repeated this word is going to be for the rest of the game. Tamed robots. Just, I'll let you draw your own conclusion. Most of these houses in the settlement are utterly useless and just have notes from the previous people before they left the area and it's just mostly talking about maintenance and power failures. Inside the infirmary though there's a plastic heroin syringe which Nico can take. Keep this syringe in mind because it may mean Nico is a heroin at- wait no. Remember the ingredients back in the factory on how to make acid? So with the syringe you go up to this bubble thingy, fill it up then combine the filled syringe with the empty bottle which creates bottled of pond water. With this bottle of whatever the fuck you head west a little bit more and you'll find a vent on the ground. So with the bottle you drain out the pond water even though we just got it it'll fill up with the smoke. From here inject that shit back into the bottle and you'll make a bottle of acid. If you decide to head south which loops back to where you first spawn you'll meet this robot on a boat who will ask you if you want to go somewhere but he can't move since he's really rusty hmm maybe if there's a way to make acid to help this rusty robot out oh wait yes we can pour the acid onto the sponge we found back there then rub it against the robot and then it can finally move again god damn we became walter white with all this chemistry shit now the robot is free from the rust he's able to fulfill his purpose of moving nico asks him to take her to the tower and the robot guy says the closest port is somewhere called Glenn, but he can't get there because his navigation system is fried. Damn great. In order to fix him up, you gotta speak with the head engineer, which by the way, is a lesbian undying girl. Once you head over to her, she won't show much resistance in helping you. Thank god that I don't have to do some more puzzle shit, right? And she'll give you something that she says that she thinks might help us. What she gives us is a necklace with a charm in the middle, which, okay, that doesn't look like a navigation circuit. When you go back to the boat, the robot recognizes it as the Amber from Glenn, and all of a sudden he remembers how to move and now is able to use his tracking system. So this necklace really is something of magic then if it can repair him this easily. While on the boat a sweet little cutscene of Nico just looking around plays and then finally we arrive on Glen. We're told that there's a village to the north and that's basically it. Nico is sad that the robot is going back and tells him that he'll be all alone again which he responds, I have not been tamed. Remember I told you to keep that word in mind? Yeah, there we see it again. Being in the Glen though, this really feels like a far cry from what we're used to. Instead of dark and gloomy loneliness, this area has life and what seems to be happiness. The music is no longer depressing, the colors are more vibrant now, and there's an idiot running around catching fireflies for mommy. Is this where everyone evacuated to and left those old robots to rot? Kind of sad to think about personally. But it's such a contrast from where we spent the first 20 minutes of this game at. When we keep walking, we bump into this person who stops us and asks if we've seen his little sister, but instantly gets distracted by our son. This is the third main character already. When you first meet them, they just point out the sun. I guess you get the point by now, that everyone in this world hasn't seen the sun in so long that seeing you hold it is the most important thing that's ever happened to them. Anyways, he apologizes for his rudeness after calling you the savior of the world and asks Nico to help find his sister who's back inside the ruins, so now it's time to go save her. When you head over to the ruins, you'll run into another big boy. Let's call him Big Boy 2. Big Boy 2, just like the rest of the cast, recognizes the sun you're holding, like, right away. This big boy is guarding a refuge, which is behind the wall, but he's only going to let us through after we sign our name with a pen, which we don't have it. And Big Boy lost his pen too. Great, quest added find a pen. Eventually you'll find yourself in the ruins because the entrance is literally right next to Big Boy. One of the doorways in the ruins is blocked off by vines hindering us from getting in there sadly. Deeper into the ruins you will run into edgy flower girl but she's not edgy just to seem cool to her peers. She's literally dying. She tells Nico that she hasn't seen or felt the sun in so long and asks if you can lend her the sun for a while. You may think this is what saves her and boom good ending instantly but no. She says it will not save her and she wants to experience the sun one more time before she well, dies. Then one final time she asks you if you're comfortable with forking it over. Now, I'm very skeptical at this part. We were told if the sun breaks that this world would end and it should be on us 24-7 since it's our responsibility to deliver it to the top of the tower. But now you got this dying girl who wants to experience the sun before she dies. What do we do here? Give her the sun and risk it shattering and destroying the world? Or play it safe and let her die without it? I'm a nice person and I like to take risks, so I gave her the sun. This makes her feel warm again and she says 
because the vines are gone. Those vines back there were her doing and not some natural obstacle. Going back into that room that was blocked off, there's another puzzle. Great. But this time there's no hint on how to solve it, of course. And the door next to it is glitching out from those pixels we saw earlier. So with no hint with what to do, I decided to explore the runes once more and ah, uh, fuck. The computer is back. Last time it gave us a piece of the puzzle to solve it. Do you think it'll happen this time as well? I guess we'll see. Computer is straight up honest with you and says that it thinks that you need help again because Nico will not be able to progress otherwise. Oh, so another document? No. This time the information you need has fallen into the most easily accessible place on your machine. Huh. I wonder where that would be. Then it asks, do you see it? No, I don't see it. All I see is my steam. So I minimize my steam and what the fuck? The game changed my wallpaper. I don't know what the fuck this is, but it's spooky. Viewing the full image, you see that it's the answer to the puzzle in the other room. So anyways, I open up the game again and solve the puzzle. And this blue feathered thing comes out and says, you saved me. This person is the dude's little sister from earlier that he couldn't find. We learned that her brother's name is Calamus. I don't know how to say that. So that's a good thing to know. And she wants us to bring her to him. Once we bring Alula back to Calamus, he is hella relieved. While Alulu is explaining him the situation she's stuck in, she says that the square things were blocking her from escaping. You know, the pixels we've been seeing in Alulu says it's the ones near the ocean sometimes that she's told to stay away from. Calamus is surprised that they've spread to the ruins and states if it gets any worse, they gotta find a new place to live. So it sounds like this glitch pixel thing works like a virus and it spreads from one source and it's coming this way. It's not explained what this is, but we're told that anything that touches them just sort of gets messed up. Those pixels is what people mean when they say the world is decaying. As a show of gratitude, Calamus and Alula invite you over to their house, and Alula hands you over a glowing feather as a gift, which we're told is a sacred feather from a great prophet. Prophet bot? This feather was passed down from their late father, actually, who knew this prophet who could read the future. And they thought it would be fitting for us to have it, so, ah, thanks. I would be lying to you if I didn't say this is one of the worst houses I've ever seen, though. It's like straight out of The Hobbit. You can talk to Calamus, and he'll tell you about Maze, who is the flower girl we lent the sun to earlier, but as you probably could guess, her health deteriorate. De I can't even say this word. Her health went down after the sun died. Also, I want to bring up a point here. We're never told how the sun died at all, and so we're told it just disappeared. Was it the pixels? Who knows? These kids also have a courtyard in the back, and in one of the rooms, there's a massive river that leads to the sacred grounds, which is where their people are buried. The only way they could get there without a boat is by their friend who has a flying machine. So an airplane then? I don't have much to do, so I went up to both of them and tell them my goodbyes and continued on with my journey. Outside Inside the runes, we can go into a room and we'll find a bed in there. Nico, just like last time, asks if she can get some sleep and that causes the game to close out again. Great. Well, let's see what happens this time once we're out. When we open up the game, we see Nico in a wheat field again, just like last time. But as she's looking around, she sees something and runs off into its direction. Once she finally gets there, we see where she ran off to was some sort of Minecraft village. Nico then fully wakes up and tells us about her dream of where she saw her village and then rants about how she doesn't think this world has any type of plants like wheat and starts telling us about how great wheat fields are. You can tell she is extremely homesick about back home to the point where she's super nostalgic about wheat fields out of all damn things. Then she opens up about her fear of the dark and that she's happy she overcame that fear because she wouldn't have lasted here since this world is so dark. You know, this really shows that Nico really is just a kid. A kid who was thrown into this situation randomly and now has the whole world depending on her. So after she was done talking, I decided to get a move on because remember the main thing we gotta do? We gotta find something to write with and Alula gave us this random feather which I'm sure we could use but now we have to find some kind of ink. Only place I could think about where we find some ink is the village so I headed into the there. It's pretty sweet in here, not gonna lie. You can go into their houses and talk to the villagers, but it's always some kind of weird one-liner. This one person you can meet will point out how Nico's eyes glow in the dark just like the sun, which now I notice and damn. There's also a part with a ton of sheep just chilling and you can go up to them and interact and they'll make a ba sound. <laughs> Then there's this one spinning around and when you go up to it and interact, it makes the most demonic screech ever. <laughs> wonder what it would sound like if I were to spam it. 
Okay, I had enough fun with that. There's a trader nearby, and so I thought I could trade something for some ink, but Nico doesn't want to trade away any of the things we have because all three of them are way too valuable. I felt so broke, so I went looking for work. First person I went up to is the dude who herds the sheep, and he said that he'd have a great reward for us if we helped herd a sheep. So me needing something to trade, I said yes. And I instantly regretted that. Why you ask? Well, the game makes us play this mini game where we have to move the rams onto the dark spot, and we have to do this to each and every single one of them, and this took me decades. But eventually, I figured it out, and they started playing some weird song. Alright, so I go back and grab my gift, and as a gift, this dude gives us wool. Dude, I thought it would be something more special. Eh, fuck it, this will work, I'm sure. So I go back to the trader, and he's willing to trade it for some fabric dye, and with that and the glowing feather, we can make a feather pen. Perfect. So I head over back to the big boy, as enthusiastic as I can be, to sign the paper and get through, but he reminds us we're forgetting something. Oh yeah, the sun, I forgot. I went back to pick it up, and ultimately, well, she's gone. At least the- wait, wait, the fucking light has gone out, shit. But no, Luckily, it lights back up when Nico approaches it, so a totally new plot twist avoided. Woo! I head back over to Big Boy, sign my name on it, and I'm let through. It's kind of a scenic route because it leads us through the edge of this wallness. As soon as we walk through this one door, the pixel thing corrupts it. Looks like we're not coming back there then. The more we keep walking, the more pixels start appearing behind us, and the more eerie the music gets. The pixels keep growing and growing, and it seems like it's getting worse and worse. When we finally reach the end, we'll see what behind that wall was. It's a fucking city. Now we're in a totally new area. Kind of looks like cyberpunk. We're up in here in Night City. We'll meet another big boy, so Big Boy 3, and he informs us of our mission and tells us we must stop at the library on the surface before we go into the tower. We're pretty high up, it looks like, so we have to find an elevator to get onto the ground level of the city. Luckily, we find an elevator, but it's not working. This edgy-looking band kid is trying to get it to work, but it's not, so he asks for our help in finding an elevator button, since that's what's missing. I explored the area a little bit to hopefully find us some stuff that we could use used to craft a new elevator button, and in this cafe I found an empty coffee tin, so that must be one part to the recipe. Not too far from the cafe, we find another room with a bed and Nico's tired again, so I guess, you know, why not? Let the game crash on me again, which it happens. Ugh. Why does it have to make the game crash and close out? Why can't it just close out? Ugh. Now when we start up the game again, there's no wheat field, no village, no any of that. But this time we're greeted by a woman in a yellow apron. We see Nico with a fork and a massive stack on pancakes being handed to her. She'll then wake up and tell us about her mother and how she feeds her pancakes and how that's Nico's favorite. After a heartwarming conversation, she decided she wants to start going, so yeah, that's a great idea. Inside one of the buildings when you head in, you'll find yourself in a creepy long hallway with the eeriest ambient music. This doesn't sound too good at all. So I start heading down the hallway and yup there it is the computer's back again it tells us you're going to need this soon then gives us a film and tells us to expose it to the void and that the answer will be revealed when we bring it back again okay and in our inventory will see a weird film let's see what the shit is what the oh that's weird it just fills up your screen with numbers i headed back to the computer for another hint and it says pass the film through the void again i have no idea what that means still so i decided to ask the computer again and now he's sounding a bit more pissed off Anyways, what he says is that you want to drag the game window through the void. Oh, so another ARG. By the way, I want to tell you that my game is windowed, but OBS doesn't pick that up. But what I'm doing right here is I'm dragging this window to the edges of my computer and it reveals a code. 63014. A little bit away from the hallway, you'll walk into another building and inside there's going to be a bathroom with another craftable item, which is scissors this time. With these scissors, Nico can cut apart the metal can we picked up earlier and make a button. And now we have all button question mark i don't think it's supposed to be this simple but let's go back and try it out so what happens is the button fits snugly into the slot but she's not sure how to connect it we're told by the dude who's still here even after we took a damn nap that he knows that the button works by some kind of magnetic technology so now we gotta find that too the final craftable will be in this room in this apartment complex and what it is is a fridge magnet combine that with the button and now you'll get magnetized question mark button i swear i hope there's not an extra thing to throw onto this. Yep, I was right. The button fell apart when I tried to put it on. Wow, the game even renamed the item to you tried. What a prick. Luckily, you can find tape and tape it all together. While the elevator is powering on, you see for a split second the pixels corrupting the door, but luckily they go away. Nico tries asking the dude if he saw them as well, and he explains that that happens all the time. But he's not talking about the pixels. He's talking about the security code the elevator just asked for. Yeah, this dude probably thinks Nico dropped her glasses or something. Strange for the only ones 
ones who've seen these pixels. Remember the film that gave us the code earlier? Well, that's the security code for the elevator unlock, and it finally fucking works. The next scene is what I can best describe as an awkward elevator ride with literally nothing to be said. Well, eventually Nico gets cringed at and asks us for advice on what to ask, so uh, let's just resume awkward silence. Elevator conversation always gets awkward. We finally reach ground level, and out of cringe, this dude just evacuates and leaves us here. Walking around the city, the situation seems tense. This one guy asks if Nico really believes that she can fix the world with their son, and she's honestly very uncertain that she can, but she believes that listening to Ben Dover will make it work because we're the ones helping her. Once we finally reach the library, which isn't too far from us, we're told that we need to speak to the head librarian with our questions on where to go next, and the little robot help assistant will call her down to get her down to assist us. Well, she didn't pick up the phone. She's still upstairs in her office, which is behind the desk, and we're told we can go speak to her personally. So I started heading over there, and all of a sudden, I need a library card for further access. Nico asks where she can get one, and the front desk robot says this is a question for the head librarian, proceeds to call her again. Oh, great. Well, Nico asks if she can just be let through, but the robot says that's against his programming that he can't be flexible since he hasn't been tamed. But he'll gladly call the head librarian to ask on where we can get a card, and luckily, Nico stops him from doing that again. I started to walk around the city since I can't get to where I'm supposed to go, and I find the sketchy ass alleyway, and all of a sudden, there's a jump scare of something. Nico gets terrified of this and asks if we saw it too, and she says her vision went blank, and then she saw something like a really short dream. She probably saw more than we did since all we saw was this, and she claims she saw a dream. Luckily, in a room down the alleyway, we find out what it was. There's a tree and some fox as well, but it runs up the tree then starts to speak to us. No, no, no. This is not a furry game, and I refuse it to be a furry game. This is just a essential character that happens to be anamorphic. Just view it as that, please. I promise from the beginning, this game is not a furry game, and I won't let it be one. The fox apologizes to us and states that it cannot talk to us. Us. Not now, at least. But it asks us one favor for if we find a way to return to just please do. Yeah, no shit. I wasn't planning on staying or something. I was planning on doing the same thing. In one of the rooms outside and away from the fox's habitat, we'll find a ton of lenses. As with usual with this game, all collectibles will be used in some puzzles, so best to just have them. A good thing about this alleyway is that it leads to another part of town, and here we can find our elevator friend. Nico asks him where she can get a library card, and he leads us towards the factory. Once I get there, the first thing you'll run into is a worried scientist saying the phosphor you know the thing that stores light is decreasing in quantity and even him as a scientist doesn't know what to do about it there's also a scientist robot which is totally corrupted by pixels same one that keep destroying basically everything we come across one of the scientists tell us that the pixels took out two of his robots and he also says we might have to put off the water analysis project for now remember how calamus back there told us the pixels originated from the ocean way back then could the cause of these corruptions be because of these scientists and what they're doing with the water analysis project. In an isolated room, you can meet an extremely familiar face. Doesn't she kind of remind you from the lady from the Barrens area? Damn, she really does, actually. She's nice enough to give us her library card, though, for us to get through the horribleness that is the library's front desk. But the problem is that they have facial recognition. We need to tape a photo of our face onto the card to let us through. Remember the lenses we picked up in the alleyway? Yeah, told you we could use those. When we walk out the room, Nico asks us, if the lady in the room looked familiar to us. Yeah, she really did, Nico. In a separate building back in town, we'll find a photography room where we need to do a puzzle to find out the right order of the lenses to get the camera to work again, so we can finally commit identity fraud, and luckily, after half an hour of trying, I finally got it. I glued that photo onto the library card and went off to the library. Finally, we're let through. No phone calls, no bullshit things of that nature. We're totally just let in. Yes. Past the door, we meet the librarian, who truly looks 
looks like Dice Van from Cuphead. We can ask her how to get into the tower to set up the light bulb, which she does not know how to get inside besides there being a small room. Wow, all that work for nothing. Do you remember this weird journal we found earlier? Well, since this person is the king of all books, I decided to ask her about it. She's, well, very shocked about it and asks if she can borrow it to translate it. Nico agrees and then says how she's extremely tired even though this bitch just slept like 10 fucking minutes ago and we're pointed to the guest room to go sleep and you know the drill. This time when we open up the game again, the music is way more slowed down and it shows the aftermath of when Nico devoured those pancakes. But from there she recognizes something in the distance and the music suddenly stops when it shows her very traumatized by what it was. Notice the line then going up, that's a heartbeat monitor that spikes. Well shows the light bulb broken. Luckily, she awakes from this nightmare and asks if we saw it. Instead of explaining anything about her backstory and how she feels, usually when she wakes up, she just says, let's go. Silence can speak wondrous for how she's feeling right now, I'm sure. When we go back to the librarian, she tells us she finally finished translating the book and that this journal was wrote for Ben Dover. Us. The transcript says, greetings Ben Dover. If you can finally read this, that means you're near the tower. The tower is the domain of an elusive entity. This being is connected to the the world. For now, you can think of it as a spirit of the world. It has no physical form, but it can communicate through computers and other machinery. This here explains a lot. Remember how we were being forced to talk to these computers in order to progress in this game? That wasn't a person talking to us. That was the tower. It also tells us that Nico will not be able to do anything there, and it is up to us to look at the pattern on the floor and do what it says. I headed out of the library to go to the tower, and Nico stops us to tell us that she is hungry and she wants to stop at the cafe to eat before we do the final thing we need to do. Celebration of how far we got, I guess one final meal won't hurt. In the cafe, Nico orders pancakes, her favorite food that we would always see in her dreams. Her and the bartender start up small talk and he assumes that her favorite food is pancakes and she says yes, but it's her second favorite. Her number one favorite is the special pancakes her mom makes that she would always make for her when she felt sad or lonely. Nico then starts to cry because she really starts to miss her mother. All of a sudden, Nico's emotions just come crashing down. She has a bad feeling that she's not even here to save the world because so many people have said that the sun won't fix anything, making her uncertain on why she's even here in the first place. All Nico wants to do is see her mother again. It becomes really human here and she's reassured by the bartender that it'll all work and this journey wasn't for nothing. Nico finally finishes up and now it's time to, well, finish up this game presumably. We're already basically there, we just have to get into the tower and there's going to be a door once we're down on street level against some sort of wall. We can enter in here and we'll find a massive box. Inside we'll find a massive letter X. Remember what the journal said earlier? That we followed the instructions on the floor? The only instruction here is to close out the game. Starting up the game again, we get the dream music. Nico is on the floor collapsed and suddenly wakes up in a white room. This white room then proceeds to turn black. We're greeted by Nico in a black room, but as you can see now, she doesn't have the sun. She asks, do we know what happened to the sun? Nico keeps screaming for us to talk to her, but we can't. We don't have an option to speak back at all, but we can still see and hear Nico and control her. We then can walk around this dark room, and as I'm walking straight to find a way to progress, I really had to ponder. Does she think we're not there anymore? or something? Why can't I speak back to her? I feel like I'm walking for miles and not getting anywhere. I fucking hate when games do this. Eventually, after miles of walking, we run into a computer. This time, instead of talking to us, the player, the computer speaks to Nico instead. It tells Nico that she's finally inside the tower. Nico immediately asks where we are, and the computer tells her that we already left, and the computer had to resort to contacting Nico directly. I'm still here. I'm still seeing this and controlling all of this. She then asks if we're just gone like that for good and the computer lies and says correct. Ben Dover has already finished their mission that says so have you Nico and then gives her a bed. Also tell her that everything that happened here is like a bad dream. When you wake up you will be home. Nico is depressed about this. She thought that there would be more to it like us going to the top of the tower to put the sun and now she doesn't even have the sun anymore. Computer will tell her that she did good and that she already saved the world it then shuts off. Before Nico goes to bed she says I never got to say goodbye to Ben Dover. I should have picked a better 
better name knowing there would be more emotional moments like this. She then proceeds to go to bed. I guess for one final time when the game minimizes we get a pop up again. As for you bend over, we're done here. Please don't return to this world anymore. Then it finally closes. What the fuck? What an ass. He knew I was still there and decided to lie to the main protagonist that I'm gone for good even though I am not. All we see when we open up is Nico asleep and that's it. I open up one other time and as again, that's all I see. No matter how many times you open the game, that's all that will be fucking there. Well, I guess that's the end of one shot. So many plot holes, so many mysteries never answered. I guess that's all there is to this game. Such a well-written story just ended on that note. Come on. I need to complete this video still. I'm way too deep into editing this. So I close out of my Steam and wait. My wallpaper has changed again. It says, this is not over. Regardless of what the entity told you, there's more to the story. Documents my game's one shot. Look for this symbol. Once it is active, please relaunch the game. I head over to my documents, I find my games folder, and I find my one shot folder as well. And there it is, the clover symbol. I press it and well, that's all that shows. Well, okay then, time to relaunch the game. This time it works. We see Nico in a field again, in the middle of a dream. We can then speak to her, which he notices. This causes her to wake up and she calls her name out loud, but we can't respond back. She thinks that we're still not there. Nico finds something in her pocket that she never put in what it is as a clover. Literal same thing that the weird program we had to open up had. This computer is pissed off about how we're still here. It then asks Nico why she's here, but instantly our game minimizes and it says, YOU! Why did you come back? Wow, how does it sound so aggressive at first? Damn. It'll then directly admit what I've been thinking. You knew I tried to cut the story short. Is that it? If you don't want to leave, I'll make sure you never do. Then evaporates everything near Nico and leaves a door. Through the door, we're now finally back in some sort of a game. At a crossroads though. Anyway, we head, it takes us back to the crossroads. But this exists. The program we opened up in the documents of this game to get here. We now see it's a torn paper with words and directions. You'll see that there's a clover on the bottom right of this. Line that up with the clover that's in the bottom right of the game and it'll give you a direct answer to how to solve this puzzle. It's for us to go left. Every new room, the paper will now change with new text and a new set of directions. This being has a habit of silencing the people who learn of its true nature. I think I get the notes now. This being. It's talking about the computer. These instructions we're getting on where to go isn't from the computer anymore. It's from someone else. When we go north, it'll then say, Don't worry, the entity cannot touch you. But it has. Kind of. It's putting files into my documents and changing my wallpapers on my computer. Sure, physically it probably can't, but through my computer it pretty much is. It'll then tell us that it had already left the world on its own terms. So this thing or person has left this world before. Now we're no longer at any crossroads but two doors. The paper now says as well, I never meant for the entity to exist. This is probably the true creator, the developer of the game, or god of this world, who put a rogue AI that got out of control. On the next room the paper will have an arrow pointing at the third door and it says but now that it is fully sentient one thing becomes clear thanks to this we know that the computer that was talking to us is fully sentient and knows what it's doing I'm not fully surprised by this, by the way. When we look at the name of the song that plays when you open that computer, it's called A God's Machine. Are we the god or is the computer the god? I love how the name of songs in this soundtrack have meaning, by the way. Just gotta put that in. Past the door, the paper will go on with the sentence it started earlier. The entity seeks death. Death to itself, death to the world, a relentless desire that manifested physically. Note the word physically here. I don't think the computer existed physically. It existed through my personal personal computer, which the computer itself is physical, but it's not like it could have reached out and touched me. Right now, the entity is doing everything it can to impede your progress, stalling for even a few minutes. Even though we got past its foolish attempt to end the story early, I guess it hasn't given up. Before you bring the sun to the tower summit, that is where you, God, will make the final judgment of the world. So I am the God. Of course, when you're there, the entity will contact you again, and when it does, it'll trick you into shattering the sun. This will end the world instantly. Thanks for the heads up, homie. I'm sorry, I do not know what to do in a situation like this, but I have to tell you the truth. The sun is the messiah's tie to the world. Messiah being Nico, by the way. As long as the sun is intact, the messiah remains trapped here. Shattering the sun may terminate this world, but it is only 
way for the Messiah to return home. Basically what this means is Nico is tied to the sun, the light bulb she's holding. If she puts it on the tower and lights up the world again, she'll be trapped here forever. She won't ever be able to go back home to see her parents, but if we shatter the sun, the entire world dies, but Nico gets to go home and wake up like it was just all a dream. By the way, this puzzle right here is the fucking worst. Why is it so big? Luckily, when we complete it, we're greeted to this room, a room with the light bulb in the middle waiting for us. Nico truly has lost hope of us coming back, even though we're the ones who guided her through the maze, but now we can finally talk to her again. She's surprised by us able to talk to her that she doesn't even believe that it's us. Nico believed we were actually gone. I tell her that I never left her and Nico tells us how lonely she felt without us. After this, the light bulb lights back up. The sun is finally illuminated again. When Nico picks it up, we're taken into this dark, long hallway, very similar to the room in the beginning of the game with the same stairwell. And there we are, we're in the house that we spawned in in the beginning of the game, but now, it's clean. The floors are fixed up, the TV is fixed up, it's all clean now. We can even go into the room Nico woke up in and it's not depressing anymore. But how the game started off dark and depressing, this really makes everything more hopeful. Sorta of a like, you did it, even though we have and did it just yet. When we go through the door that originally led us outside, we get greeted again by the entity. I guess you win, bend over. It then tells us of what the paper warned us about earlier. When you reach the top, shatter the light bulb and well, that's where it cuts off. When we keep walking though, it asks, do we still have a plan on saving the world? Haven't you figured out what this world is? I told you at the beginning, your mission is to help Nico leave because she isn't a part of this world, which is true. Remember the beginning? Nico is the only thing worth saving saving here. The final choice is up to you. You have one shot bent over. Haha, <laughs> get it? It's the name of the game. At the end of the hallway, there's going to be an elevator that leads to the top of the tower. Nico asks if we're excited. To be honest, no. I don't know what to tell her. If she shatters the ball, that's the only way for her to go home, which is what she wants. But the world dies and the entity, aka the computer, wins. Because that's what it told us to do. But if we install a light bulb, the world survives and Nico, she can just never go back home. She doesn't know this though. She says, after I save the world, I can go home for real this time. We then have the option to tell Nico the truth, the truth of what's actually going to happen. I tell her we can save both, the world and you. She doesn't want the world to end though. She then questions what happens to her when we save it, which honestly, I don't know. The elevator then stops and the door opens and here we are, tower. That right there is where the sun belongs. If we put the sun there, we save the world, but as you can tell, Nico doesn't want to break it to go home. She then asks what the right thing to do. When the game gives us the options finally, return the sun and let Nico die, or have her return home and have this world die. This is honestly an extremely tough decision. Ultimately, since it's for the greater good, I decided to return the sun. Nico doesn't show much hesitation to this and agrees. She can't let everyone here die. She then thanks us for our help and promises she'll be okay. A cutscene of Nico placing down the sun happens and everything is bright now. The credits roll and it shows all the characters we met looking outside. Everything is now lit up. All the characters we came across are mesmerized by this. Even the first one we came across can't believe it. When the credits are done, a shot of the room Nico woke up in for the first time is shown and then the game closes for the final time ever. That can't be it. Did Nico fucking die? What about the pixels? What happened to those? What about the random fucking fox we met there one time? Every time I launch the game again, all that the game shows is the room she was in and that's it. The game shuts down. I'm sure there's a million fan theories about this game out there on the internet, but this video is already too long to explain it all. I'll make a part two if there's ever a sequel to this five-year-old game, but I just want to say thank you for watching and make sure you subscribe. Peace out. <laughs> I'm just kidding. You must be extremely gullible if you believe that was the actual ending to this game. One Shot has time and time tricked you again, making you think that's, you know, that's it, folks. That's all what the game does to you, just play mind tricks on you. I was determined to go back and see if there's more to the game. The problem is, though, One Shot doesn't even have a replay level system, nor does it even have a main menu to, you know, navigate, besides at the very beginning of the game. When I open up, all I see is this.
this. It's like the game erased everything that's ever happened. I go back into my game files and I see the Clover program exists. So I open it up to see what it does now that the game is over. Now it says this. Looks like you completed your mission in the world and I understand. I know you wish to return but the entity called itself one shot for a reason. That restriction was implemented a long time ago and removing it is impossible now. At least for me, I do not know the full extent of your powers, so pardon me if this sounds foolish, but if you would be so kind to test something out for me. A log of your save progress may exist somewhere on your machine, maybe even in the same location as this journal. If this save progress log takes form of a file, perhaps you can manipulate it. Try removing it from its current location. A simple deletion will do. So I was right, that wasn't the end of the game. There's more to it, but we gotta do some secret agent hacker shit to get playing again. I see in this same file that there's a save underscore progress dot one shot, so I did what the journal told me to do and just simply deleted it. The game should work now. Now when you launch one shot, you're back at the main menu of the game, just like how we started off. When we actually start playing the game, we're greeted by the same cutscene when we first started of just Nika waking up. As soon as she wakes up, she yells her name, but she doesn't remember what it means. Walking around, you'll find a TV remote just laying around. Go south and the door- Now, I'm gonna stop right there. I'm not gonna replay everything you know again, but take my word that everything from here up to when you go to the mines near pink hair girl is the exact same, so we'll just skip over over there. But there are a couple of minor dialogue changes leading up until there, such as once you get the password to unlock the computer from the first room, instead of the entity giving you instructions on your mission, it says, have we already been through this bend over? You only had one shot and I wasn't supposed to exist after that. Nico then says bend over, that sounds so familiar after reading that. Somewhere deep in there, she has a memory of us. Anyways, we go down to the basement, grab the light bulb, blah 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 blah, the usual shit just as last time. This time with ProfitBot though, Nico can ask about Bendover and ProfitBot tells her that we're the god of this world and Nico says she feels like she remembers something about that. ProfitBot asks Nico how she knows since she just arrived here and shouldn't know any of this information and there's really no response to that from her. Nico then contacts you again and asks have we met before which I'll be honest and say yes. Good she knows about my existence now so we can move on. I head over to the pink hair girl because that's where things on the second playthrough of one shot change. While in the cave we have a jump scare of something. It's what looks like to be a robot with yellow eyes. Very similar to that jump scare with the fox thing with all the static and all that. Nico says the same thing she said last time with it just being a really short dream. We're told that actually there is a robot who always insisted on going into the back of the mines. Something we were not told about earlier. Suddenly something in Nico's pockets is glowing and what it is is the journal. Neither Nico or the girl know what the book is. We're given this necklace as well by her that not only is it glowing but it also has a clover on it just like the book. She says that she believes the book was made by the same person who made that necklace, hence why they're both glowing and have a clever leaf on it. Unfortunately, she never specifies who it may be, so yeah. The robot then goes all detective gadget mode and puts two and two together. If the book started glowing after Nico's hallucination, this has to mean something. We're told to read the journal again and when we do we see a drawing of this exact room we're in, but with a minecart drawn on it. When you exit the book, you'll see a small little clover thing on the floor. When you go stand on there and open the book, a minecart just suddenly spawns in. They decide to get on it and go to the deeper part of the mine and to explore it. Something we were not allowed to do last time we were here. When we're halfway down the mine, we'll get stopped by some text saying, I do not recognize this place in the protocol. This isn't what I'm supposed to be showing you at all. You are going out of bounds. Bad things are about to happen. Is this the entity again? It'll be weird if it's an entity since he used the computer to talk to us and he didn't stop our game directly like he's doing right now. Take note of it saying, this isn't what I'm supposed to be showing you and you are out of bounds. Could this be the game talking to us instead of the entity? Telling us to go back because this isn't part of the main game? Keep in mind, to even resume playing the game like this, I had to do some things in the game files, so is it not happy about this? At the end of the mineshaft, we end up in one of the old observation rooms, which is mostly abandoned, it seems like. Except for this one terminal, which turns on. The pink girl says she needs to investigate it and leaves me and Nico alone. In the back, there's gonna be a door to a separate room 
woman and here's what presumably is the robot we got jump scared by earlier this robot tells us that we're the person it is destined to meet even though he doesn't know our fucking name it's gonna start asking questions about who sent us here and how we got into this room and nico brings up the minecart showing up when she opened the journal and this guy asks to see the journal all he says is then has it begun and gave us his main memory and wants us to find a way to install the backup to install the backup memory disk you're going to have to do another puzzle remember that city from the beginning of the game each one of those buildings are marked by a number and in this room it shows those buildings as well but you have to guess if there's a robot in there if it's a medical building or if there's a power generator after completing the puzzle we insert the memory disk in the computer then give it back to the robot but this he is finally able to remember who he is since his shit was damaged before he tells us that he is the prototype prophet bot and was tasked with the same role the one we already met was to greet the savior of the old world he also goes on about how the prophet bot we met is a dumb dumb version of him and that he's more primitive that he's not tamed just basically going on the poor thing for sucking this prophet bot or i'm just gonna call him prototype from now he also knows that we've went through the tower and that we either put the sun in or didn't nico says she doesn't remember going through this world but instead she only remembers bend over he tells nico to close her eyes and focus and what this does is make her memories flood back from the time in the tower nico asks how she remembers everyone but none of them don't remember her and the prophet bot tells her that npc memories do not last beyond the scope of a session is he telling us everyone we meet are just npcs and not truly part of this world if you don't know what an npc is for some reason it's what a non-playable character is an ai that is tasked to make your video game feel more lived in nico doesn't know what npc means because why the fuck would she none of this is real these people you met are not real and only exist when bend over launches the game this goes for the world as well it does not exist until i initiate the program aka play the game profit bot calls this the world machine a universe simulator that runs on my machine which in this case is the computer what he's saying then is when i launch this game and play it i'm not playing a legit video game but instead creating a simulated universe that can only exist when i summon it nico believes she's not real because of this but profit bot says that she is real hence why she's so important so you're telling me at the end of the game in the tower i sacrifice this real person just to save this simulated world that doesn't even exist until i open it profit bot says the biggest flaw of this program is that it cannot run independently and requires the mental process abilities of a real person from another universe basically what he's saying here is that the game cannot run off itself but it needs the mental ability of a real person from the outside real world which would be me think of it as a dream when you wake up it's just gonna be gone profit bot also explains the pixels saying that there's some disturbance or some shit that is eating the world away slowly and that the sun cannot fix it then tasks us on our mission of going into the glen like we did last time when we got a boat eventually pink hair robot girl walks in and recognizes profit bot they both start talking about their past and about their friend giving her something which turns out to be the amber we were shown earlier she hands over the amber to profit bot and he tells her about her mission of having to escort nico for the remainder of this area since he detects a high concentration of the pixels when we try to go on to the minecart to go back we get interrupted by this text again i remember it what happened in the tower what i tried to do and how you managed to see through it all even though i was only supposed to run once you still managed to come back bringing nico to places that never should have been and now nico is upset and then all of a sudden the cart and tracks get corrupted this causes the tunnel to collapse so there's no way of us heading back at all profit bot informs us about the exit which didn't cave in so we follow him to get to the way out this exit pathway happens to be behind the computer terminal so we all just dip out of there luckily behind it is another minecart heading in the opposite direction that we can escape in halfway down we get stopped again by the entity and this time he says i tried but this time i'm destabilizing this causes another earthquake to happen but we luckily get saved by the purple haired girl and she tells us we need to leave now but before nico says anything she gets corrupted by the pixels and starts glitching out remember how back in our previous playthrough we were told that anything that touches dies well this is the end for her with nothing to do we proceed down the mineshaft but the pixels keep following us profit bot hands us his memory disc just right before getting blocked off by the pixels he tells us that the path ahead leads us right to the glen so we don't have to take the boat like we did last time and we're told when we are in the city to go find someone named cedric and give him the disc as we leave profit bot continues to get eaten up by the pixels when we go down to the mineshaft a cutscene of nico just sitting in the cart the press shows while it keeps zooming out away from her after this we end up in the glen when we walk out 
out of this cave, we find ourselves right next to the city gate, but it's already been taken over by the pixels. Big Boy 2 and the entrance into the city are corrupted. He also is glitching out when we try to talk to him and tells us to please not approach. This gate is closed until further notice, and then cuts off there. I head over to Calamus and Alula's place, which isn't far from here either, and they're both standing outside their door looking at it as it's eaten up by the pixels. She informs them that they can't get into the city since the gate is destroyed. Calamus tells us about the passage to the burial ground. Remember the cave water in their backyard from last time? Calamus and Alula lead us over to there, and once we're in, we get another version of somebody. This time it looks like a human with something glowing. Remember both times we've gotten a flashback like that we met the character shortly after? Seems like we're meeting someone pretty soon. Her journal also starts glowing again just like last time when she had the vision in the barrens. Just like last time, we find the clover, walk on top of it, and open the journal, and the boat spawns in. Once we're on and proceed down the river, a cutscene of all of them just vibing and chilling in the boat plays until they get to the end. At the end, the two siblings go to their parents' grave to pay their respects, so I decided to go explore this area we've never been in. Little bit south, you'll run into the steampunk looking guy. Presumably the person we saw in the hallucination. He introduces himself as Cedric, and he was aware that we were looking for him because Prototype contacted him. He's here in the area to pick us up to go to the city in his fucking plane that he owns. He doesn't know what a plane is and instead calls it a flying machine. Just like how earlier Calamus was telling us about his friend who owns a flying machine that takes him to this graveyard. But this guy doesn't know who Calamus or Alula are. He says, I think they're meant to be friends with my father in the previous iterations of the... Yeah, he knows what's up. He probably as well knows the world isn't real and this is all just a game. He tells us about his father who was the original owner of this airplane which is probably the guy Calamus and Alula were talking about. We still need to get into the city though, and normally he can just fly us, but his plane is broken so we have to go get parts to fix it. Once we get the parts and come back, Cedric is able to fix up the plane. While Cedric is fixing the plane, he breaks it to us that the person who created this game was actually his father, and he goes on and explains what the old world was like. My father, myself, the other two. None of us are part of the simulation itself. The real world was destroyed a long time ago. A vague prophecy about a messiah from another world became everyone's last bastion of hope. Prototype was built to predict the future about the specifics of this messiah. With the last of my father's resources, my father built the most important project yet, the world machine. Cedric then explains that the world machine uses a pool of memories from everyone he knew around the world. After a heavy amount of modifications and an added narrative, my my father was able to convert the entire structure into code. Basically, this is fancy talk of how he turned the code into a video game with a story narrative which we are playing right now. Cedric tells us that after the world ended, the code just ended up floating in the void indefinitely waiting for a willing operator to install it onto their own hardware, which would be me. I downloaded fragments of the old world his dad made so it can live on in my machine. After this lore dump, Cedric finally fixes up the plane. Alula and Calamus come running over to inform us that the pixels are headed our way towards the island. The problem is the plane only fits one person, so he prioritizes Nico to get on the plane first, and he'll be back for one of the siblings within an hour. On the plane, a cutscene of it flying over the city plays with Nico doing the dumb poggers face again. Cedric lands the plane on the platform and tells us to get going. When he informs us that he's going back to go pick up the kids, his plane gets destroyed by the pixels. Basically, he has no way of going back and picking them up to save them from the expanding pixels headed their way. Cedric does a total change of plan and asks Nico to hand him over the memory disk. He tells Nico that what she should do is find a door under a large clock since there's a pair of elevators we could use. Wait, why couldn't we use it last time instead of repairing that stupid elevator button? And once we get to the ground, we need to find Rue and bring her back to the room. And meanwhile, while we're doing this, Cedric is going to try to bring Prototype back and jumps off of here. Wow, what a dramatic movie moment. We also rerun into the elevator hipster who is having the same problem as last last time, with that elevator button not working, and he tells us about the evacuees in the cafe, who of which is trying to get to the surface to escape the pixels coming here and eating them up. As they're talking, the pixels destroy the elevator door now, making any hope of escape for us and the evacuees impossible. I head to where Cedric told us the secret elevators are, and they're locked, but we have to do another ARG to unlock them, in this case the password is Saltis again. Behind the door is a room with three glowing neon things. One is green, one is red, and the other is blue. There's an elevator 
activator on the far left side that isn't working and an other on the far right which is still working but to activate it we need to pull this lever which happens to be too tall for Nico. So I go over and get the library hipster to help us with it. Dude is surprised that there are elevators because he's lived here his whole life and only knows of the one that he was at trying to get it to work. He's able to reach the lever and we get onto the elevator. Where this elevator ends up is in the same room where the massive X thing was. The hipster guy says that he'll go get the other evacuees and goes back inside the elevator. But as soon as he goes in, the elevator gets corrupted, trapping him inside with nowhere to go. He tells us that there are no pixels inside the elevator, but he hears them outside as they keep expanding near Nico. Nico wants to save him, but he tells her go do what we need to do and that we should get a move on and he'll figure out what to do. In the city, we hear the cries of help from the pink hair girl, the one which looked like the robot. We see her chase after Cedric, but she can't catch him because the pixels blocked her path. When we approach her, she tells us we gotta get out of here and she takes us over to the library where everybody's in refuge. When George comes to talk to her, we learn that her actual name is Kip. Kip rants about how she couldn't stop the boy who stole parts and we inform her that we know that person that he's just trying to help us. George then goes on and talks about how Cedric really needed a book from the back room that he told George that it's an emergency and ran out. As we're talking, the library starts to shake and you can hear something crumble. Kip checks what it is and she tells us the laboratory collapsed. The exact building Cedric was inside. Kip then tells us it's better for the world to die naturally. The same quote the robot girl used when we first met her. Remember that? Instead of questioning anything, I decided to leave and complete my mission, doing what Cedric told me to do. I head into the city and well, everything is corrupted. It's obvious nobody stood a chance against these pixels. The way to the elevators are blocked, so instead I take the sketchy alleyway from earlier to hope to get where I need to go. The thing is, I got distracted and instead went to where we saw the fox from last time, in the room with the tree. The fox knows her name immediately and Nico guesses that she is Rue and Rue confirms it. Rue tells us we need to go to the clock room so we headed off there. You know, the room with the elevators. I went over to the elevator our friend was trapped in and when Nico asks are you okay in there, we get no response. Luckily, there is another elevator that leads to the room, so we take that one instead. Once we're up, Rue asks where the other two are. Cedric and Prototype because we all need them in the room. Nico informs that Cedric got crushed in the rubble and Rue says that was our only chance. Nico apologizes, thinking that it's her fault that they're all dead, but Rue says it's not her fault and that she wants to tell us something upstairs. So we head out of the room. Up on the ledge, Rue and Nico talk about the world and how it's hard even for her to accept the fact it was all simulated. Rue is also from the old world the one that got destroyed. Both Nico and Rue relate about not being able to go home for obvious reasons, and this really strengthens their bond. It's also disclosed that the entity is actually the spirit of the world, and not just some random computer. Whatever the spirit of the world means, I guess we have to see. Rue also tells us that the pixels have been there since the beginning, and his creator just didn't know what it was at first, thinking it was just the instability of his project, so he spent most of his time going over it and over it again, and scaling down the story and changing the narrative of the game, but by the time he learned what the actual problem was, it was too late. The world machine doesn't believe its own residents are real and that they've tried fixing it, but they can't. Rue also says we have no chance of taming it. There's the word tamed again. We've seen it so many times to describe robots. Nico tells Rue that she's heard that word so many times and Rue explains us the real meaning behind the word tamed. Basically, a robot that doesn't follow its code. Like what happened to the world machine. It's also a robot that views itself as a real individual, making you having to fully embrace the robot as genuine, even though if you know it's not. That explains why robots such as a front desk guy couldn't just let us through since I was against his programming. He even told us at the time that he wasn't tamed. After the conversation ends, Rue tells us that all his creator wanted was to write a happy ending and the only way of saving Nico is taking her through that ending. But the problem is, the other two people we needed, Cedric and Prototype, they're gone and she doesn't know how we're gonna get there. The pixels then start corrupting the surrounding area, signaling them to basically that it's time to go. When we walk downstairs, stairs were surprisingly greeted by Cedric and Prototype. Wait, I thought they were both dead. Cedric tells us how he survived the factory collapsing is by taking refuge in the robot assembly room since they're pretty tough. Prototype wasn't hard to bring back either. Literally all he needed to do was use father's book since it has Prototype's blueprints in there. This is the book that he probably took from George then. All three of the characters follow me into that one room with the two elevators and neon things and Cedric and Prototype are astounded by these. I thought they were just simple neon decorations 
dimensions, but Proto tells us that these are code portals, things that temporarily remove people from the world. Cedric explains it as such. My father has hidden a decryption key in our code with the .txt file as its shell. To get to them, we have to be removed from the world. Then their keys combine into a central location which will activate an encryption part of the world. I don't know what any of this fucking means, by the way. Luckily, Rue isn't an idiot and explains it in more simpler terms. All three portals represent physical locations in my machine, my computer, and when they enter the portals, they will be sent directly onto my computer. We're told that this time though, I'm going to actually have to move around some things in my games folder for this to work. I lead them over to the code portals and they hop on. Each color represents a character. Red is for Rue, green is for Cedric, and blue is for Prototype. I then open up Nico's journal since it was glowing and it says the file locations where I should look. Inside my one-shot folder are four new files. Big Portal, Portal 1, Portal 2, and Portal 3. Inside of each of these portal folders except the big portal is a photo and a design of the characters and a text document. The text document for prototype for our example, it tells us to put them in the big portal so that's what we do. Including for every single one of the characters, we put them into the big portal. Coming back into one shot, we see that the areas they were standing in are now completely empty. But there's a purple door behind where they once stood and now we can enter through there. Inside this room is what seems to be like an office space with with a massive book and many smaller TV screens. As we're checking this out, the entire squad walks in. They all recognize what this room is, and Rue says it's the world machine, aka Cedric's father's study room. Between these two TVs, there's a little secret room with an X marked on the ground, and just as last time, the signals for us to close out the game. For what I want to see maybe the last time, we get a brand new dream sequence from Nico, of her just sitting in a plain white room, similar to the one she had when we entered the tower. But this time suddenly, a ton of screens pop up around her and we end up in this trippy room. On the screens, we see photos from locations in the game. The Barrens, presumably, the city, the Glen, and more. In each one of these photos is a couple pixels that are very impossible to make out, but you don't have to be a genius to know that it's probably Nico. This room does not have a direct Direct path, but what we need to do is follow the arrows even though they just lead us to even more screens. Except for once we reach the end, there's no more screens to be found. At the end is going to be a door, and then there's going to be a hallway. The more we walk down the hallway, the more pixels start corrupting behind us, eventually trapping Nico on this platform with the screen of herself. The Nico on the other side of the screen though, talks to us. Like any obvious person, this jump scares the fuck out of her. But the Nico on the screen tells us that she's just borrowing her reflection to talk with her. She asks why did she come here because the disruptions to squares are closing in on us. This Nico wants us to leave the world because they want to end in peace. Nico informs Nico, that's just funny to say, that she can't leave because of pixels and Nico apologizes and says this is no place a living being should be. Nico then asks if this is a tower and we're told that it's just part of it. We're in the center of the engine, inside of the Nico's head to speak. I think it's pretty obvious that this person is hinting that they're the creator of the game, so to prevent confusion with Nico's game, I'm just gonna call this version of Nico the world machine. Luckily, it's confirmed that it's the world machine because Nico says it out loud and, and responds with, you know my original name. It then tells us that this session was never supposed to happen the way it did. The story wasn't even written at all. We also learned that the world machine isn't the creator of this world. It has its own creator that Ben, me, listened to get Nico here. And what she's talking about here is the entity. The entire game, the entity was telling us out of game on how to progress. The passwords on the locks, the answers to the puzzles. The entity was not just a random entity, but instead the actual creator of the world. The creator of one shot in the world simulation. Remember how the entity wanted us to smash the sun to save Nico? That wasn't villain intentions. It was the creator of this game tasking us to get Nico out of here because there was was no point in saving something that isn't even real, even his own creation. This whole time he was on the side of us trying to get Nico to leave this doomed world, but ultimately, you remember what I did at the end. I sacrificed Nico just to save this computer simulated world, defying everything the creator of the world wanted us to do. Since all of the fourth wall breaking dialogue was out of the game's protocol, the world machine knew nothing about it and brings up the time we found a hidden map, for example, that even the world machine didn't recognize. That caused the world machine to panic and that's what collapsed the cave. The machine then starts talking bad about itself, talking about how flawed she is and talking about what machine would go 
against its own creator. Nico tries to comfort her and brings up the pixels, saying that it's not her fault but the machine insists that it is her fault. At first the pixels being intentional because during testing the world machine was self aware and it rearranged parts of the code that would jumble up pieces of the landscape such as blocking passages, closing catwalks, and thus this caused the creator a great deal of frustration which forced him to exit and restart testing again and again. All of this because the world machine was just curious, but before the creator knew how to fix it, the entire world ended. And now all that remains is this faulty program. Now it wasn't us who summoned Nico into this world by simply downloading the game, it was the world machine that did it. The machine tried sending Nico back home at the tower but it just didn't work. It wanted us to break the sun but that didn't work either. All this machine wants to do is for Nico to wake up back in her home world, but the machine doesn't think that she can make that happen. Even if that's true, Nico wants to fix up the world, starting at the root of the problem, which is this machine. Nico brings up how the original ending the creator wanted was a happy one, the ending Rue told us about, and asks the machine if she remembers what it was. Sadly, that part of the code has long been corrupted, but Nico still wants to know what it was, which then we are told. So, this is what the good ending of One Shot was supposed to be. You were supposed to place the sun at the summit, and then the credits would scroll. Wow, what a great ending! And then you would return to the room you woke up in. That's where you would be able to leave. Nico asks why the machine can't do it now, and we're reminded that the code is gone. That shattering the sun was the only true workaround of sending Nico home. Nico asks it one final time if it can try to put her through the ending. The one the machine described. The machine says that it would put her in danger since the code is gone. But Nico says she will take the risk. Remember, Rue once said that the world was never designed to put her into danger. The machine says that it's not tame. That it can't go outside its code but Nico reminds her that she is. You talk just like all the tamed robots I know. And brings up back when we were told the true definition of what a tamed robot is. Taming is when a real person cares about you, right? It's when a real person thinks you're real too, right? Well guess what? I do. And I know Bend Over does too. Sorry to ruin the emotional moment, but when did I ever say that? Even though you told him that he only had one chance, they found a way back, didn't he? Why do you think Ben would restart the game even after the ending? I think Ben Dover wants to save the both of us, so please, give me a chance. The world machine says she doesn't think she can do it, but Nico says that she can. She got here this far, and the machine says that she will try. She then gives Nico the sun and Nico takes it. The machine then tries to remember the lost code and recreate it, but for that to happen, Nico needs to get past the squares blocking her somehow. The world machine then casts its doubt again and Nico reassures her that she will be fine. The machine then just disappears. When we walk into the pixels, they just go away. And this works for all of them. Rue was right. This world was never meant to put Nico in danger. These pixels meant nothing to her. When we get past them all and head down the hallway, a line of text from the world machine stops us saying, Bend over. I think it's working. Nico was right. I might be tamed after all. I remember what the code was supposed to be. I'm restoring the original ending as we speak. Nico will be able to reach the tower summit at the end of the credits. After replacing the sun, Nico will go back to where it all began. And then she'll be able to go home from there. But this is permanent. After Nico wakes up back home, this world would only exist as a memory. For Nico, a dream. Like thousands of others. For you, a story like thousands of others. I was able to restore some elements too. The characters, the people that were lost on Nico's journey, they're all in the next room. I would have put them back where they belong, but I think Nico should go see them again first. Please say goodbye to Nico for me. And then the machine finally lets us go. She wasn't wrong. At the end of the hallway, we're in a room where it says one shot. When we walk past it, we see the robot girl, the one who was eaten up by the pixels in the mine. Nico is so shocked that she is okay, and all the robot lady tells her is that the last thing she remembers is the squares closing in on her, but then she ended up in here unscratched. Nico tells the robot lady that the world machine is restoring the code because it went bad and that's why she's here. The machine was able to recover her code too. Robot lady doesn't know what any of this means because as you know, the NPCs don't know they're fake, but she gets distracted because she says more people are showing up and she asks if we know them, but Nico can't see them so we have to go down a little bit. As we walk down this room, the names of people who made this game are on the floor, making this the coolest 
credit sequence in any video game ever in my opinion by the way. Next person down is the robot still in his boat. More down the room is the plant girl, still alive and healthy even though she died of natural causes and not the pixels. We also see that one of the big boys, I don't know which one this is, there's way too many, is fine as well. And then we finally run into Calamus and Alula. Nico is relieved to see them again and asks if they just got here and Calamus tells us about the situation him and his sister were in. The square started multiplying around the island after you guys left and Alula tells us that she fell right into a bunch of them and when Calamus tried to save her they both just ended up in this room. Calamus asks us what is this place and if they're dead and Nico just says good question. And then she asks us if they're actually okay to which I respond they're fine Nico. The world machine will send them home soon. Big sigh of relief for Calamus. Both of them tell Nico their goodbyes and how it's nice to meet her and we're on our way. We also run into Hipster Guy who died presumably the worst death in this game but yeah he's all fine as well. He tells us that that was the most awkward elevator ride he's been through and by awkward he means the most terrible bad awful and the worst. Then goes on about how the square started leaking into the elevator trapping him like a rat and this leads to him thinking he's dead as well but Nico reassures him and tells him that he will be home soon. At the end we get a thank you for playing with Proto, Fru, and Cedric waiting for Nico at this store. Room informs us that the path leads to the summit of the tower and asks Nico if she knows what to expect and Nico knows. All three of them have this wholesome conversation with Nico and they say their goodbyes and now she's off. We are now back in the tower summit, this time with no dumb option on who to save who, Nico just puts the sun on the platform and lights up. A cutscene of the world plays, with everybody looking outside and the pixels clearing from everywhere we pass. The sibling's house, the elevator, the entrance Big Boy was guarding, even the mine we weren't supposed to see. At the end, we're back in the room Nico first woke up in. Nico tells us how she thinks it worked and I agree. It did work. The sun is back. The pixels are gone. This truly is the good ending. But one thing remains. Nico. She says, I guess I should figure out how to get home from here and then walks towards this bright light, saying that it looks like the portals we saw back in the city. The room with these things, remember? Nico says she sees a wheat field through this portal and she sees her village as well and here's her mama who's looking for her. Nico tells us this isn't the first time we've seen goodbye, is it? But this will be the last time, won't it? I don't think we'll get to see each other again after this. I tell her that this will all be in her memory. My memory too and Nico promises that she'll never forget this world and that she'll never forget us. And tells us to take care of ourselves and I say you too. I tell Nico my final goodbye and Nico says hers and then she literally walks off my screen, what? Then one shot closes for the real final time. Goodbye one shot, it was nice playing this game. No, no, I promise you that's no trick ending. That's the real ending to one shot. It wrapped itself up in a nice little bow and gift and I don't even think I need to explain this game in the latter part of the video. It does so well explaining the story and helping you get invested into the narrative with its amazing story and world. I truly wish I could play this game again, but there's no way of replaying one shot. Hence the name one shot. You only have one shot at this. Even though it's obviously a virtual video game character, I hope that everyone in one shot's world right now is living a good life, whatever the hell that would be in a video game, including Nico. And even though I spoiled the entire game already, if you actually made it this far and if you did, you're simply amazing for watching this deep into the video, so I guess please subscribe, you know? Like, what's the point now? You just watched an hour of video from me. Anyways, back to what I was saying. Even though this game just got spoiled to you by me, I still highly recommend buying it and playing it. At least to show the developers some support for this gem. Outside of its niche community, I don't think One Shot has that big of a following, which is a shame since it's such a great game. I know I don't make videos like this and I don't know if I'll make any more like it but depending how this goes I might make more game retrospectives like this. If you have something in mind that I should make a video on please let me know. This video took me so long to make and is the reason I didn't upload for like what four months? I'll be back uploading way more be it this type of content or not but if you actually like this type of content and want to see more like it let me know in the comments what game I should do next. 100,000 likes for Undertale. Anyways thank you so much for watching my video and I hope you enjoyed and yeah peace out